There are only a few select items that can be truly iconic to their product type. When someone talks about search engines, we visualize Google. If the topic of automatic rifles appears, in most instances people will think of the AK-47 or the M16. The examples can go on and on from here. In a similar category to the subject of today, when people speak of tanks, they either envision the Tiger, Sherman, or T-34 from World War II, or they envision the Abrams from more modern conflicts. Even if there are other notable machines from around the world, or from those eras, those are the first ones that springs to people's minds. In today's video, we are going to be talking about what is in my opinion, the default tank for the setting of Battletech. When someone says tank, one of these vehicles is probably what most people imagine, both in setting and among the player base. Defiance Industries is the premier manufacturer of the Inner Sphere, and the vehicle in today's video is one of its greatest accomplishments. The Patton Series of Battle Tanks. A heavy tank weighing in at 65 tons, the Patton and its alternative design, the Rommel, were built by Defiance Industries for the last stages of what is known as the Succession Wars. The entirety of the undertaking of the building of the Patton series of tanks would begin as an attempt to build a tank which was reliable, vicious on the battlefield, and one which could be more easily procured for localized defense forces which would then in theory free up battle mechs to be part of military formations that could contribute to offensive operations against enemy house territories. This is a normal role for vehicles regardless by this stage of warfare. However, most vehicles utilize an internal combustion engine. While on the tabletop, this is not much of an issue in terms of logistics, resupply, and even maintenance. IC engines add their own unique strategic problems. What happens if a column of tanks is deployed, but outrun their supply lines? Certainly, ammunition could still be a problem, though it's less likely to be one than simply running out of fuel. Defiance decided for their premier battle tanks that they would provide the best defensive results by being powered by fusion engines. The only problem was, this was being thought of during the latter parts of the Third Succession War. The First, Second, and Third Succession Wars had done catastrophic destruction to the Inner Sphere in terms of its infrastructure, but also in terms of its technology and even its knowledge base, so much so that even interstellar civilization itself seemed to be on the cusp of implosion. Damaged factories could never be repaired, and should they be destroyed or disabled, the technology within would become oddities and rarities for only the most noble-blooded in the Inner Sphere. What this meant was that there was a massive scarcity for parts during the Succession Wars, even at the intro tech level. One of the most sought after components that could almost never be sourced in enough numbers were the extremely rare and valuable fusion engines. The very engines proposed to be inserted into these new, untested tank designs. Normally, almost all of these engines were earmarked for either aerospace fighters or for the lords of the battlefield, battle mechs. But Defiance displayed during the latter part of the Succession Wars, in the early 31st century, a willingness to push back against the darkness of entropy and backwardsness. Not only did Defiance decide to build an entirely new tank, from scratch, not even taking an old Star League design and simply refitting it, as was the norm during the Succession Wars, they decided that this new battle tank, this new main battle tank series at that, would be powered by a fusion standard engine. In the 3010s and 3020s, when these thoughts were being formulated, this kind of proposal was literally almost unheard of. Often just the musings of engineers or executives with no real teeth behind such an idea or plan. And any real commitment to it as a result was even more unheard of. But. Much like many of the innovations from this era, particularly that appeared in the Lear and Commonwealth and Federated Sons, these tanks pushed the envelope in there being new concepts and began breathing life back into the stagnant and declining inner sphere intellectually and industrially. 
Defiance made the pattern a reality in the 3020s, with it entering full production in 3027. To achieve this prior to the discovery of the Hell Memory Core, one should note, they built a brand new factory on Hesphorus for manufacturing fusion engines. And this was an enormous and costly undertaking. But when new facilities like this are built, it creates a new wave of skilled labor. It creates institutional knowledge on how to replicate it as well. More efficient and effective ways to manufacture the components may be found too, as the products are produced in greater numbers. In other words, individuals and organizations learn, and they grow, and it makes these expansions yet easier for the most part into the future. The patent series, in its own way, in other words, helped open the Leering Commonwealth to the future, and it would start this process during the last two succession wars. Truth be told, however, this was really a step forward for the Commonwealth, which would help it survive the clan invasion, as it was made all the stronger for it, and created the men and women necessary not just in the armed forces, but in the industries of the Commonwealth, to make resisting and repelling the clan invasion possible. The patent story is most important not just because of its battlefield role, but because of its place in the story of the intellectual and industrial revitalization that the Inner Sphere would undergo during and after the Fourth Succession War, a revitalization it desperately needed. It is an innovative, forward-thinking, industrially important war machine that helped change the face of the Inner Sphere, and it was done with no help from a lost memory core. To add to this, the design of both the Patton and the Rommel are superb for their time, and not just simply in their game stats, but also in terms of the engineering choices made in how they were built. First, the Patton series follows tank designs that were much closer to the traditional vehicles of the late 20th century, rather than the large-scaled, tall war machines that often appear in Battletech since the Age of War in Star League. While the Manticore is a fantastic tank, it is tall in an attempt to help it fight battle mechs, for instance. By contrast, the Patton is in fact designed to have a low profile, much like the Abrams MBT or T-72. This decision was directly made for the same reasons it's made today. It allows the tank to go through cities and through relatively hilled areas in a way which more easily conceals its profile, giving enemy tanks, infantry, and mechs a more difficult target to hit. While this doesn't necessarily translate into the tabletop game, it does translate into the broader setting and its backstory. In fact, in order to get the main cannon to fit on the smaller profiled turret, a turret which again more resembles a modern tank, Defiance entirely redesigned the primary weapon on both the Rommel and the Patton to fit these lower profile areas. Another act which was extremely uncommon and expensive during the darkness of the latter succession wars. The first run of these tanks, their prototypes, were directed by Hermann Steiner, the project lead and Archon Katrina Steiner's uncle, to be inserted into the renowned mercenary unit known as Hansen's Rough Riders for testing. The Rough Riders would press these tanks hard and use them aggressively in battle in order to find any major design flaws. They were driven ruthlessly into the destructive fires of war during the Third Succession War and survived their ordeal. On the other side of this trial of steel and violence, the Patton series would begin to be produced and broadly adopted in 3027, and it would never cease to impress its operators. It would find a home in the Leering Commonwealth Armed Forces, naturally, before appearing in the Davian half of the Federated Commonwealth, during the brief union of these two major states. The Patton would also begin to be seen in the Free Rosselhaig Republic, as Steiner attempted to buy influence with the new state, in some futility admittedly, with the sales of these tanks and its Rommel variant prior to the clan invasion. The latter would in fact make their own knockoff of the Rommel particularly, known as the Axel, which would end up being an internal combustion engine variant of the design before evolving down its own tree of advancement due to the involvement of their new masters, the Dominion. The Patton would be there for the brutal slugging match of the Fourth Succession War, and for the dogged and desperate battles of the clan invasion. It would evolve into a fearsome monster, along with the Rommel, for the Federated Commonwealth's violent divorce, before transforming once more into the Blakist Era. 
it has transformed once again, returning to favor in both the Lyran Commonwealth and the Federated Sons for the Dark Ages and Ilkhan era, becoming both a Defiance and General Motors product by this point. This series of tank, in its main form, was named for George S. Patton, while its sister tank, which uses the exact same components outside of its turret's cannon, is named for Erwin Rommel. In essence, they are titled for two men on opposite sides of the terrible Second World War on Terra, a thousand years before the birth of the tanks themselves. But the reason I bring these names up, particularly Patton's, is that it is fitting. George S. Patton was a man who loved war, despite disliking or feeling disgusted by some of its excesses. He, in fact, believed himself to be a reincarnation of soldiers throughout history, from across many wars, and believed in each of his lives he would be reincarnated as a new soldier, on a quest of becoming an ever more perfect combatant and warrior. He would give lectures on past wars, for instance, and would even say he had been in the battle he was lecturing about, when asked about how he could know such details about certain engagements. He genuinely believed this. This tank is in some small way what George S. Patton wished he could have lived as. It is a warrior that will appear across time, fighting with its crews in battles throughout the inner sphere, inside the broad scope of humanity's held territories, warring, winning, or dying again and again in battle after battle. The Patton is the chariot which will carry these brave soldiers to their destinies, time and again to prove themselves in the brutal conflicts analogous to the ones which Patton seemed to love so much. It is fitting, ironic, and sad in equal measures that this tank personifies him so. The primary basis of the series, the Patton is a rough and ready 65-ton war machine of the late Succession Wars. To start with its profile, this model, and its cousin the Rommel, were born into an era without advanced onboard components, such as endo-steel or anything like it. As a result, these have standard control equipment, and general onboard systems, along with a 6.5-ton internal structure. Both possess a 1.5-ton low-profile turret as well though the turret offers no additional in-game benefit for being so at this time, to my knowledge, at least in its base form. Because it's powered by a Fusion standard engine, it does possess 10 onboard heat sinks as well, which means the Patton and its cousin can fire energy weapons without a problem, provided they don't overheat. Neither will based off of their limited energy weapons though. For its communications, the Patton and Rommel utilize the Tharhes Muse 54-58K, and for their targeting and tracking systems, they have the Tharhes Mars 5. Neither of these add additional rules to the tank, however. The baseline Patton and Rommel have no quirks at this time, either positive or negative, at least that I can find regarding their initial models. The latest version of Recognition Guide 27, however, does change this. The catalyst for the design itself and the most significant component of the Patton can be found clearly with its relatively unique engine. Equipped with a Magna 260 Fusion standard engine which weighs 20.5 tons, the Patton can achieve a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour, or 6 movement points in the tabletop game. This movement is important, as it allows the Patton to move at the expected speed of mainline battle formations. It's fast enough to gain some defensive bonuses if it moves at flank and isn't impeded by too much terrain, and it can fight effectively while cruising as well. While there are faster tanks and mechs, they have different battlefield roles than the Patton. Its speed reflects its role, and it is effective. Where the Patton really shines, in particular against its primary variant, the Rommel, is in the realm of defense. The Patton, for a 65-ton vehicle, has a staggering 14.5 tons of standard plating, yielding at a mass of 232 points of armor, making it as heavily guarded as an Orion, but with fewer locations to cover with its armor points. This means it can take absolutely punishing amounts of fire to its chassis before it's disabled, barring lucky hits, of course. This level of defense means dislodging a Patton from a defensive position, or even taking it out on the move can be incredibly difficult, 
To give perspective, its side armor and front can withstand twin AC-20 hits to those locations, as can its turret. In the case of the turret and front, they can even weather a further AC-10 or PPC blast without being penetrated. This is an exceptional level of protection, and this means, especially against significantly less hostile and extreme forms of fire, the Patton may be a lingering problem for other tanks, or even battle mechs, to deal with on the battlefield. The Patton has a great reputation for the Succession Wars, but at a glance it can seem underwhelming in the firepower department. Armed primarily with a turret-mounted Defiance Killer Autocannon Type T, or an AC-10 Autocannon with 20 rounds of ammunition, this tank's profile matches a modern MBT much more than it does any of the more outlandishly gunned tanks of the Battletech setting. All the same, this gun has a solid range for its time, it's reliable, and it deals consistent levels of hole-punching damage turn on turn. Backing this up, for poking targets or trying to crit-seek, it has a Coventry 5-tube missile system, or LRM-5. It's got very long range, in essence, and does minimal damage. All the same, it is not without its uses. Finally, it has a hotshot flamer for dealing with infantry threats or vehicles foolish enough to get close to it, and an A5L small laser. The Patton's weapons all have a role, and all of them make sense, especially when taking into account that it is not a soul hunter on the battlefield, and instead will be deployed with other armored and localized fighting forces. The Patton is a moderately fast, insanely durable tank with a threatening gun for its time but an albeit somewhat lesser level of firepower. Still, it's far too heavily gunned to ignore regardless. It's hard to engage at range if it doesn't want to be, especially in areas with forests, hills, towns, or cities, and it is still inexpensive enough to be easily accompanied by an assortment of dangerous fellow tanks. The Patton, for its time, is one of the most impressive tanks ever produced. The counterpart to the Patton in its initial development was the Rommel. Effectively the same tank with the same engine, chassis, and overall components. The only primary difference between the two is its armored protection and main cannon. The Rommel, in essence, was mostly used as a marketing tool in order to gain more sales, promoting it as being wholly its own tank, rather than being a Patton variant. The truth is, however, the Rommel, at least until it received a much more substantial change after the clan invasion, is in essence a Patton with a giant gun. Replacing out its Defiance Killer Autocannon for a Defiance Mech Hunter Autocannon, or AC-20, this dramatically shortens the range of the Rommel, but gives it a colossal punch. It is even able to completely destroy some light mechs in a single hit. It maintains 20 rounds of fire giving it an impressive level of longevity on the battlefield with such an exceptionally dangerous gun. It does drop its flamethrower to do this, but it also reduces its armored plating by 3.5 tons, making it significantly more vulnerable to incoming fire. Should it be caught in the open, the Rommel doesn't have the range or durability to survive quite as long. However, should it be used with a patent, with one covering the other, the two can be a devastating combination. A much less known variant of the Patton and the Rommel, and truthfully following more in the footsteps of the Rommel, is the tank built by the Free Rosselhaig Republic, copying the chassis of the Liren tank and replacing out its expensive and hard to manufacture fusion engine with a traditional internal combustion engine. This reverse engineered Swedish knockoff of the technologically advanced tanks that were sold to the Republic, despite being inferior in some ways, is still nothing to be ignored. Armored like a Rommel, it is slower, moves only 54 kilometers per hour, and maintains an AC-20 autocannon. It goes on to replace out the small laser for a pair of machine guns, and then upgrades the LRM-5 to an LRM-10. This means it's a more capable fighter in straight engagements, compared to either the Patton or the Rommel. But one thing I've stressed in many of my videos, and I hope I can stress here, is that movement is arguably the most important component of the game. It's too slow to outrun a problem, in other words, and it can't reposition easily. Worse yet, it can't get significant defensive bonuses easily while on the move, and its more limited armor means that if it is engaged outside of its AC-20's range, it will experience problems. In-universe, the logistics support of the IC engine as well means it requires more attention than its Lyran counterparts. 
The first major refit of the patent after the clan invasion would come in the form of what it is dubbed the Ultra Variant, pointing towards its new cannon. Replacing out the traditional AC-10 for its rapid-fire counterpart in the form of the Mirrodon XL Ultra Type 10 autocannon, and giving it 30 rounds of ammunition, this model delivers a more consistent stream of fire on targets, at still an impressive range of up to 18 hexes. For backup and to deal with infantry, it has three machine guns, including one which is rear-mounted. To try to deal with heavier targets in close, it exploits the use of its heat sinks and installs two medium lasers. This model is a fierce competitor to any opposition on the battlefield. The latest variant of the patent to appear in service, fielded by Innersure Powers, is the Patton XL, named for its XL engine, which frees up a reasonable amount of weight on board. Built by General Motors and Defiance Industries, this tank appears most frequently in both the Federated Sons and the Lyran Commonwealth, though they are sold to outside powers and mercenaries frequently enough that they are viewed as being available in any military in the Inner Sphere. The tank is described as both cutting edge, but also as being ludicrous in its opulence. Maintaining the Ultra AC-10 from the prior model, as it is a directly built successor to the Ultra variant, it then goes on to install a targeting computer increasing the lethality of all of its systems, replacing its traditional LRM missiles across all models for a Holly MML-5 launcher, and replacing out the small laser with a Martel X medium pulse laser. This pattern has a mixture of ranged firepower across the board, especially when it leans into its main gun. On top of this, for dealing with those pesky infantry, it does continue to have its traditional hotshot flamer, just in case it wants to invite them to a barbecue. Its armor is dropped to 13 tons, but then it installs ferrofibrous plating, returning the total volume back up to 232 points of protection. Yet more interesting, this is the first version of the pattern I've seen with quirks, namely the narrow and low profile quirk, making it harder to deal damage to with ranged weapons. Though it does suffer from the poor targeting at close range perk, making it less viable at short ranges when using the advanced rules. Overall, this tank is an exceptionally dangerous machine, and one which can fight at all ranges well, while being durable enough to be hard to remove from the field, and it should be, given how expensive it is. The Rommel itself will go through a series of changes with time as well, including a dedicated howitzer model. The most prominent Rommel, however, to appear with the majority of the same configuration as the original, and without becoming an indirect fire weapon, is the Goss variant. Funnily enough, this model of tank actually harmed sales, as it was put in direct competition with the Patton Ultra, which hurt both tanks apparently in terms of confusing potential buyers. Still, it's armed with five machine guns for dealing with close range targets and two medium lasers. The main cannon, however, as you have probably already guessed, replacing its AC-20, is a vicious Goss rifle. Going from a short-range ambush predator to a long-range sniper, it is a very big shift in function, but it's exactly what the Rommel did. The model continues to see service all the way into the Ill Clan era. The latest variant of the Rommel in a direct combat vehicle form is the Sealed variant, which is environmentally sealed and becomes more of a dedicated energy weapon platform. It has more armor than prior models as well, at least on the front, turret, and sides, and installs an XL engine. For other equipment, it installs a Guardian ECM, allowing it to obscure enemy sensors where possible. Exploiting its sealed properties, it has a short-range Torpedo 4 launcher, allowing it to strike from shallow waters if needed. Next up, for infantry and in close, it maintains three machine guns. Not to be stuck wholly in the water either, it also has an SRM-6 streak launcher on the hull as well, allowing it to strike targets in close and crit-seek with missiles. For the main cannon, however, it steps away from ballistics or goss altogether and installs an incredibly powerful heavy PPC, which hits just as hard as a goss rifle, but works in the water and has no ammunition limit. Despite being not quite as new as the Patton XL, the sealed Rommel is no slouch when it comes to utilizing advanced and innovative technologies. And it definitely gets the job done. It would be Clan Ghostbear that would mostly devour the remnants of the Free Rosselhaig Republic, 
and in doing so, they would inherit its industries. This included the manufacturing centers of the off-brand Rommel, known as the Axle. Terrifyingly, the Ghost Bears would not only reinstall a 260 Fusion Standard engine, but they would also utilize clan technologies for its weapon systems to turn it into a truly deadly monster, even to advanced battle mechs. Adorning the hull with Clan Feral Vibrus, the Axle 2C has more armor than the Padden outside of its slightly less armored turret, and it installs a Clan ECM suite. On top of this, it has an anti-personnel Gauss rifle in the front instead of a machine gun. For its main cannon, it mounts a Clan Large Pulse Laser, giving it insane range and insane accuracy. This is arguably potentially the best weapon in the game that doesn't headcap. Finally, it has a pair of Clan LRM-15 launchers with Artemis IV fire control systems, letting it rip into targets at any range, especially given they have two tons of ammunition per launcher. This is an exceptionally dangerous tank, and it's not even the most dangerous Axel. The Axel 2C XL is exactly what you'd imagine. What if the clans installed an XL engine? What if they made that XL engine a 325? making the axle move at 86 kilometers per hour, or eight movement points in the tabletop game. Well, to start with, it almost has the exact same weapons as the original, only it replaces the large pulse laser with an ER large laser. It then adds a targeting computer and an anti-missile system. This makes it incredibly accurate, but with longer range, and it's more defensive. But not only does the AMS help with missiles, because it can flank and cruise so much faster, it is harder to hit due to being able to gain more defensive bonuses on the move. Scarier yet, it can reposition more easily as well. The Axel 2C XL is far and away the most dangerous patent variant in the entire system. It's faster, it's more heavily gunned, and it's more powerful in every range bracket. Turns out advanced technologies allowing for more speed, range, and damage can do a lot for a vehicle or a battle mech. The Patton is a tank with many names, and one which has evolved into several distinct branches of vehicles. Whether it be the relatively mobile, heavily armored Patton, or the more heavily gunned Rommel, or even the now faster, more powerful Clan Axel, these vehicles are all dangerous, and they do their roles exceptionally well. The Patton, though, is more than just a piece on the board, as described in the introduction. It was the catalyst for a series of industrial and technological developments that displayed the return to innovation and away from stagnation. The fact that it is an exceptional tank as well, which is the reason it still stands in the Ale Clan era, isn't necessarily the most important contribution it made to the Inner Sphere. Progress is its greatest contribution. You will find that the Patton tank is a part of the new Battletech Mercenaries Kickstarter, and will be appearing in the Battle and Sweep Battlefield Support Pack. It's pretty awesome, and has the companions of a J. Edgar, Drilson, and Pike vehicles. If you want to get a hold of these sooner than later, and you would like to contribute to the enormous Kickstarter which has over $6 million in funds raised so far, there are only a few hours left to do so as of the making of this video, particularly about two days. I'd recommend checking it out, especially since if we get to 7 million or 8 million, many of the people backing at what they call the company level or higher will start getting more force packs and salvage boxes, including force packs that can contain, in fact, the Patton Battle Tank. And at 8 million, it will unlock the Somerset Strikers pack, as well as the Blood Asp. It'll be really cool. Remember, only 48 hours to go. Check out the link in the description. A good plan, violently executed now, is better than a perfect plan next week. Thank you all for joining me here today. It was very terrible to actually record this video as I am still sick and I hope it didn't come through too much in the audio. It was very interesting for me to cover this, given there were so many variants I opted to go over because there are so many variants of the patent as a whole. 
It's also interesting to me because there was a lot of wrong information going around regarding one of its variants more recently, with people speculating and obsessing over the idea that the Rommel was removed from the setting when it was directly referenced four times in the recent recognition guide, and is displayed as being an active and available and manufactured vehicle during the later eras regardless on the MUL. So it was really weird for me to see all of that unfold. But, all the same, the Patton and its variants, the ROM only axle, are all fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider liking it and subscribing to the channel. If you'd really like to support this channel further and what I do though, have you considered hitting the join button on YouTube and joining as a YouTube member? When you join as a member, you help support what I do for these videos. Which means it is as I say, which is this content is only made possible because of viewers like you. And with that, I will catch everyone in the comment section below.